Well, welcome back, guys. <laughs> Sorry it's hot. I had opened all these, so I don't know who closed them on me in between the times. I had the doors open. Because I don't know what's wrong with the air conditioner. I haven't been in this room since we were last here for Bible study. So I apologize. Hopefully by next week it'll be better. So, um, so yeah, I'm doing a series on the, what the Catechism teaches on prayer, um, at least part of it. And uh, I'll, of course, add things from Scripture and the saints and some other ideas. But I want to kind of go through and actually see what our church teaches and the main sort of um, ideas, concepts, and uh, practices that the church recommends for faith. So before we get started and do our opening prayer, I just want to, I have two handouts. One's a big one because... And I will not make recopies of this because you can find it for free. But at least initially, this is the Catechism on Prayer, the whole section. So you have it there to be able to look at uh, at a glance as we go through it. And then, yeah. <laughs> and then if you lose it, you'll have to look it up on your phone or bring your book. Uh, and then the second one is a much smaller handout uh, that over looks over some of the initial... Um, parts of the faith. So as those are going around, let's go ahead and we'll start with prayer and just place ourselves in the presence of God and who we're going to learn more and more about what prayer is, how to best facilitate it, what it's supposed to do. So drawing close to him in our mind and our heart, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty and ever-living God, we come before you, Lord, and during this series, we ask that you would enlighten our minds with a deeper understanding of the gift of prayer that you have bestowed upon us and stir our hearts to desire to draw ever closer to you through that prayer. We ask all of this in Jesus, in Jesus Christ, our Lord's name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so as I mentioned, we're going to be talking about the catechism's uh, teaching on prayer. And so I want to give a little bit of a, a background on the catechism. Um, Prior to the Reformation, um, there were no such things as catechisms as we know them today. Uh, the ca first catechism is born out of the Reformation. It was called the Catechism of the Council of Trent, sometimes called the Catechism of St. Pius X. And that was the first catechism. And it's at that time in history, because of the Protestant Reformation, that the church feels the need to actually um, publish a document in which all the teachings, at least the basic um, teachings of the church, are laid out. So the first one was done directly in response to the Protestant Reformation. Now, after that, catechisms begin to just um, explode everywhere across the Catholic world. Um, the first thing done by the, the bishops of, in the United States, which was Baltimore, was to create the catechism, the Baltimore Catechism, which would last for about 200 plus years, um, along with a prayer book for all Catholics. So catechisms are kind of this thing that's summaries of our faith that help us understand and see it right from the beginning. Now, this catechism came about really through the efforts of Pope St. John Paul II, uh, following the Second Vatican Council and all the changes that came about through that council, um, both to kind of end confusion in the Catholic world that's, that followed the council, um, as well as update the church's teachings in areas where the council had spoke at, on a, about that, um, Pope John Paul II um, ordered that there would be a creation of a new catechism, which took a number of years, and I believe the first one was published in 1993. Uh, it was published, if you didn't know, Every document, official document in the Vatican, the first language it's written in is French because more French people work at the Vatican than any other nation. So it is not Latin. So the 1993 one, which was brown, you might have seen it, the old light brown catechism, that was based on the French version. When the official Latin one came out in 97, four years later, then a new um, green version was uh, released by the church to update it to correspond to the Latin, which is always the, quote, official um, language of the church's documents. Um, only recently, in the last couple of years, 
this has been updated again, uh, specifically really to just add one section. The church is teaching on, on uh, um, death penalty, which has changed. So um, the catechism is John Paul's idea to kind of help, um, as I said, stem the confusion. And it was also a way to empower the laity because where most catechisms in the past were really given to the bishops and they were the ones who decided how the catechisms were dispersed, how new ones could be written, etc. cetera. Uh, John Paul II did both. He released them to the bishops with a special mandate that each college of bishops should make its own catechism unique to its place. So we have one for the United States, a bright red one. Um, but secondarily, he ordered that it just be available, made available to every Catholic so that every Catholic can know what the church teaches um, without ever having directly said that, but from some of his other encyclicals and such, clearly he was kind of worried that we don't always get the right information from the priests and bishops who are our leaders. So now you can look at the book and say, yeah, you're wrong, right? So th there's a reason why the catechism came out. Now, the catechism is divided into four parts uh, based around four major aspects of the faith. The first part has to do with doctrine, and it's based on the creed. The second section has to do with the liturgy, focused on the seven sacraments. The third section has to do with uh, morality, based on the Ten Commandments. And then the fourth section, the one we're going to be looking at, the first half of the fourth section, is prayer, uh, based uh, primarily on the Lord's Prayer. That's actually part two of, of, of the, or the second half of part four. We're not going to look at that. I'm not going to go into the Lord's Prayer in the great detail the Catechism does, but we're going to look at all the information about prayer that's leading up to that. And so it's important to realize that prayer is just one part in this whole aspect of everything the church does. So on the handout I gave you, not the one of the Catechism itself, Right at the top, you see a quote from the Catechism that actually is the very first quote also, if you were to look at the Catechism handout, it's the very first one to start this whole section. And it does so by situating the, the idea of prayer within the larger Christian context. So it says, quote, great is the mystery of faith. The church professes this mystery in the Apostles' Creed. That's part one. Celebrates it in the sacramental liturgy. Part two, so that the life of the faithful may be conformed to Christ in the Holy Spirit to the glory of God the Father. Part three, so now here's four. The mystery that, this mystery then requires that the faithful believe in it, they celebrate it, and they live it from a vital and personal relationship with the living and true God. This relationship is prayer. So several things about the introductory paragraph, so to speak. It's the same mystery of faith, basically the incarnation, the trinity, and the paschal mystery, that's the guiding thread through everything that the Catholic Church believes, teaches, and practices. That's what flows through all of it, the same thing. Uh, it's the same faith we believe in, as seen by the creed, that we celebrate by the seven sacraments, that we live according to, uh, the, the Ten Commandments, and ultimately, as far as we're concerned with this fourth part on prayer, it is the same mystery that is personally experienced and participated in a relationship with the most holy trinity. Like the church is clear, this relationship is prayer. So although there are other religious practices and spiritual exercises that form our individual spirituality, but always they will always include some form of prayer as well. The catechism is, cl is clear that about a couple things. One, prayer is only one factor among several. So it's mentioned doctrine, liturgy, life, conformity to the gospel, and then you have prayer. This has been the case of the church from the beginning. The reason why this catechism and every catechism prior to it has four parts comes from the book of Acts. And on the first um, page of the handout, if you look about five lines up, 
you see an italicized quote. Italicized are always the Bible if they're, um, or, or another document. So this describes the very first church in Jerusalem after the resurrection. Quote, they devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles. That's the doctrine, part one, the creed. And to the communal life, that's part three, as we, as we do it now, the life of the Beatitudes and the Ten Commandments. To the breaking of the bread, so there you have the sacramental life, that's the oldest reference to the Eucharist as a practice like that. Everyone there had already been baptized previously too at this point. And then finally, and to the prayers. And notice it's not to prayer, it's to the prayers. That's because the early Christian church based its own um, cycle of the year and of every day on the Jewish understanding of prayer. The liturgy of the hours that is said by Franciscans like myself, by all the religious orders, by priests, by monks, by nuns, required, and any lay person who wants to, the church didn't make that up. We copied it 100% from Judaism. Judaism has the book, the Siddur, in which they pray multiple times a day. And so it's clear that we're talking about the communal life of prayer of the church, not just my individual personal prayer, but to actually involve myself in a larger prayer of the whole community. Um, so as we begin looking at what Catholic prayer is, it's always important to keep in mind what the church says right at the beginning. And that is this. The purpose of prayer is to facilitate, quote, a vital and personal relationship with the living and true God. That's the, the whole point of prayer. That's what its focus is. That's what it's geared to. Uh, it's prayer is where the liturgy, the doctrine, and the morality all become concrete in how I relate to God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The other thing that the Catholic Church does is that they, they make an equal sign between these two things. Spirituality is prayer, period. Any spirituality in practice that does not include prayer is not really spirituality as far as the church says. So you can fast, but you better be fasting and praying, or else your fast is not a spiritual act. Right? You can give alms, but unless it's also connected to prayer, again, it's not going to be a spiritual act. So the church is very clear about this. For anything to be truly spirituality, it has to include this understanding um, of prayer. So with that, looking at the catechism part just for a second, and this is a direct... Uh, whether you have it in this book, whether you may have the little white paperback version, whether you were to look at this online, the paragraph numbers will never change. It's going to be the exact same. This particular one kind of gives you at a, at a site, you can kind of see what's going on. So this is part four, section one, prayer in Christian life. So it has kind of this introductory paragraph. Then notice what the first part's going to do that we're going to look at today. It's going to explain what prayer is in general. And then it's going to tell us three things that prayer is primarily. Prayer is a divine gift from God. Prayer is God's gift. Prayer is a relationship, a bond with the Lord of obedience and service. That's covenant. And prayer is a communion, an interpersonal, intimate um, relationship with the Holy Spirit. And then after that, we'll look just a little bit um, at the next page, which is um, the revelation of prayer, how prayer comes about. And that's what this first handout will, will cover as we're looking at that. Now, before we come back to the handout, I want to make a few preliminary things to talk about and discuss so that we can understand prayer a little better. Um, the saints, well, the church itself, but the saints especially highlight the fact that prayer is absolutely essential to salvation and that there is no excuse whatsoever for a person not to practice prayer on a daily basis. 
doesn't mean it might it ha will always be at the same time or that it can't be has to be a quick you know throwing something up really fast but prayer has to be something that's done every day and saint Teresa of avila who i drew a lot from for this first handout is clear about this um, you may not be able to participate in the liturgy many people don't today and not just those who don't want to right homebound people people who don't have access to a priest or a church in any you know, close area, they can't practice the liturgy. Similarly, we can't all necessarily do the, the practice the um, service and charitable works of the church for a variety of reasons. Again, we're homebound, we're ill, we're whatever. But everyone anywhere under any circumstance can always pray. And so it's interesting because in her, probably her most famous work, The Interior Castle or The Mansions, St. Teresa of Avila begins the very first mansion and she makes several points that are very important for all of us starting in prayer um, and to understand prayer better. And one thing she highlights over and over again is, is this. The first thing is this. There is, the, for, the, for the person trying to pray better, your focus should never be on worrying about any technique or method or practice of prayer, but your first and primary duty should always be to align yourself more and more with the gospel. And she gives five points in the beginning of that, of that section. So what are these things she says? Well, the first thing she mentions is prayer is interpersonal, right? For you and I as, as Christians, and for Jews as well and Muslims, God is a personal being. Prayer must be personal. We do not practice or accept any kind of impersonal, just generic, it's not technically even called prayer, but things such as in Buddhist, atheistic forms of Buddhism, some forms of Hinduism. No, it's always interpersonal. It's between Father, Son, and Spirit and me, as well as me and the community. And because it's interpersonal, there is no technique, method, or practice that can guarantee anything because it's a relationship, not a gimmick. And an infinite God cannot be manipulated by whatever you do. Um, I have a sister, an older, one of my older sisters, who at USD became Buddhist. Okay. <laughs> USD is not a great school. I, I went there for law school and undergrad, but I would never recommend it, to be honest. She's remained Buddhist. My sister believes, as most Buddhists do, that by simply doing the correct chant, in the correct posture, in the correct frame of mind, things happen. Regardless. Right? It's cause and effect. Christians don't believe that at all. There is nothing I can do that guarantees God has to do anything. Right? God is infinite. He's omniscient. He's omnipotent. There is nothing I can do that can in any way force God to have to commit himself. So our prayer is always going to have to be this personal relationship with the Lord. And that's what uh, St. Teresa makes abundantly clear. Number two, she says... We have to seek, we not only have to seek to avoid offending God, right, trying not to sin and overcoming the sins we have, but we also have to learn to draw near to him. Now, it's interesting is here's how she describes beginners. So see what the saint's idea of a beginner is as opposed to maybe our own or the modern church's version. Down on, um, or here's how she describes it. These are people, quote, who want to avoid offending God who may perform good works, yet at this early stage, they're still absorbed to worldly matters and pleasures so much that they're puffed up with all the worldly honors and ambitions they have. Because they are free from serious sin, the king does dwell in their castle, but they have only the most tenuous relationship with him. They scarcely see his light because they are so submerged in the things of the world. Right, so, a beginner is someone who's actively trying to move beyond that, to really make their relationship with God the center part 
of their life. Now she, and she refers to those people in the beginning. That's how they are. Now, what's the third thing she gives advice to all beginners? It must always be love, not reasoning, that guides all prayer, divine devotion, and obedience. Right? We can never understand God completely, but we can always love him with our whole heart to the extent we're able to at that time. And reason falls short, ultimately, of ever understanding God fully. John of the Cross, the other great Carmelite saint, he has a more specific way of putting this where he describes in more detail why this is. He says, the entire life of faith, the entire thing, is darkness. All of it. And then he says, how do we know that? Because it starts in darkness, which... Uh, is because to start the journey of faith, we have to divest ourselves of a certain things we liked before, a certain lifestyle, certain attitudes, certain things. And that divestment feels like a death of sorts. So it's a darkness. Then second, the whole journey itself from beginning to end is a darkness because it's faith. And faith is not sight. And therefore, we are in darkness. And then finally, if you thought upon the arrival, you'd get it, forget it. Why? Because God can't be known, even in heaven. The finite us, even in glory, cannot comprehend the infinite God. So even in heaven, we won't know everything, but we'll love him beyond measure. But notice what St. Teresa says in very basic terms, John lays out in the dark night of the soul, right? One of the first paragraphs is this whole journey is darkness. And it's funny because at first this sounds odd, but the more familiar you become, especially with the saints' writings, the more you realize this is what all of them say, right? Bonaventure says in one of his, uh, in the mind's journey to God, so the Franciscan tradition, he says, Seek darkness, not clarity. And perhaps one of the most famous is Mother Teresa, who almost quotes Bonaventure but changes a little. Do not ask, do not ask for clarity, but always ask for the darkness. Teresa of Calcutta. So this is a, a common understanding. And it's not just the saints, this is scripture. Right? Paul, when he's writing to Timothy, describes God as what? The one who dwells in light unapproachable, whom no one has seen nor ever can see. Right? So the, the image of this darkness is just one of the parts. We will experience God. We will see him. But we're never going to understand him with our minds. And so Teresa, true to the, the, both Judaism and Christianity, says... So always put love in front of knowledge and reasoning in your relationship with the Lord and, and in um, dealing with that. Number four, she says, avoid at all costs any aso close association with evil. Right? She points out all of us come into association with evil simply by being in the world, but we can, to some extent, over the things we have control over, avoid certain situations, persons, etc., that tend to drag us down or, or bring us back into that evil. Instead, we have to practice a daily fidelity in doing the divine will. And then her last thing is very interesting, too. The thing I love about all the saints is they're very contemporary, no matter when they lived or wrote. So Teresa writes this. Do not excuse yourself from prayer for any reason, for there will never be a perfect time, place, spouse, or anything else that will make prayer easier later. To think so is a complete fantasy, she says. Right? So we always excuse ourselves. Oh, if my spouse were more religious like me, then my prayer life would be better. Oh, if I lived in a different place or I had a different job, my, my, my prayer life would be better. Teresa says, no, it wouldn't. You're lying to yourself. Just start now. 
Why are you excusing yourself? Just do it. And then you'll see it takes off. And that's important because, uh, again, coming back to Teresa and her understanding of techniques and methods, she's very clear. She says, no saint, no document of the church has ever taught that the reason that some people are spiritually immature or lack intimacy with God, the church has never taught that that's because they just didn't practice the right method. No. The reason why a person is away from God is because they have refused to accept the gospel as it is in its entirety and live by it. It has nothing to do with the method you choose. Right? The rosary didn't exist as a method for most of Christian history. It's only been around 800 years. And even then, it hasn't been as popular as it is for a long time. So we have to be careful with focusing too much on methods or centering prayer or specific types of meditation and getting so caught up in all the details and specifics, we kind of miss the bigger picture of just entering into this relationship um, with God. And the point is, as we're going to see as the catechism as we go through this, the catechism is clear that without prayer, our faith becomes weak. And in the long term, you're just not going to make it as a Christian if you don't really learn how to pray, right? As it said at that first paragraph, prayer is a vital necessity for all of us. Uh, the, later, I'll ask the question, the catechism, how can the Holy Spirit be our life if our heart is far from him? And at this point, I'm going to move away from the Carmelites, and now let's look at the, the Franciscans, my own tradition. So in the Franciscan tradition, there are five easily memor memorizable givens about prayer that we need to grasp. Very simple, but actually very profound as we go through them. So what are these five givens? These, you can write them down or not if you want. They are important to understanding ways to grasp the life of prayer. The first one, the more a person prays, the more they want to pray, right? We are created by God in order to pray. Next class, we'll look at that when we look at the Old Testament in a seemingly innocuous thing that people don't even look at, the, from the very state, first pages of Genesis, we have prayer placed into the human person. At the creation of Adam, made out of the dirt, and God breathes into him the breath of life. But where does God breathe it into him? His nostrils. Why? Not his mouth. Ah, because in Judaism, meditation always includes breathing only through the nose while you pray and chant the name of God. So right from the very beginning, in fact, the words are the similar. The Jewish word for meditation is hit bonenut. The Jewish word for praying in silence through breathing is hit bo dedut. One letter difference on purpose to show that these two are always connected. So there's this connection. The more we pray, the more we want to pray. So as we begin the life of prayer, we start to fulfill that longing we have for something that feels like it's missing. And as we keep it on it, and as we keep true to it and faithful to it, the more intense we do it, the greater the results. And so as we continue to grow and grow and grow by this means, um, that inherent power that God has already placed in us is awakened, strengthened, and draws ever closer to God, little by little, but constantly. Number two, the converse is also true. The less we pray, the less we want to pray. And in the, the spiritual tradition of St. Francis, there are three spiritual illnesses these are spiritual, but you can see how they draw from the physical ones. Um, the three are um, spiritual anemia, spiritual atrophy, and spiritual sclerosis. 
they're all really kind of the same thing, but just sort of highlights different aspects. So what does this mean for those who don't pray? Well, the less we pray, the more is created within us less of a desire to pray, which then results in what? Even less prayer, right? You catch yourself in what Francis called the deadly cycle. And what happens? Well, we abandon prayer for some valid reason. Well, I can't today because blah, blah, blah. And then one day becomes a couple days. And then it becomes a week. Then it becomes a month. And then before we know it, the effort needed to kind of start up again seems so insurmountable in our minds that a lot of times we just give up or we make it very superficial, right? And so we become more distracted because what prayer does is it unifies us. It unifies us with God. It unifies us within ourselves, our mind, our emotions, our body. It helps to unify our relationships with others. So although it may not seem that way, sometimes we only experience the negative, not the positive of prayer. What I mean by that is you might not feel that unity, but if you stop praying for a week, two or so, you'll definitely feel the disunity that suddenly arises, right? Because then in our distraction, instead of becoming more focused on God, we become more distracted by all the different things out there vying for our attention. And so with that, we um, become lazier. And as we're more scattered, the easier it comes to um, find excuses not to return to prayer. And as this continues more and more, through this anemia, it enters into the second stage, which is atrophy. And that is at this point, because we no longer engage in regular prayer, God in a personal sense, as a person, as someone we interact with, begins to recede. And more and more, God simply becomes an idea or a concept. One we might still believe in, but it's not a living relationship that we have with God anymore. And so in a sense, as we move further and further away from the source of life, and we reject the grace that God is constantly giving us, there's no more expansion, right? Everything in life is either growing or dying. There's no true neutral in life, and that's true of your relationship with God. If you are not progressing, you're regressing. Nobody stays in the same place. And so now with atrophy, we're actually seeing a regression. And it's interesting because the Franciscan tradition has always used sort of the effects of these on the physical body to explain the spiritual one, right? Anemia and atrophy both are, for the most part, painless and quiet. Until you reach the point of no return, there's no spectacular symptoms. You just suddenly go from slowly de you know, <laughs> diminishing Tell Dot, you're dead. And it's the same way. The person doesn't see it coming. They might still think they're very religious, etc., but they're slowly dying and reaching that point of spiritual death already until they reach this third stage, this sclerosis, as it's called. Um, and what he talks about that is that um, our interior life becomes because we don't excise it, it becomes hard and rigid. And it becomes very difficult, like I said, to make the effort to now sort of start over. Um, you know, this isn't just true in the spiritual life. If any of you, physical activities, even a lot of mental ones, if you don't do it for a long time, you lose the, the understanding, right? I mean, mm -hmm. uh, if, if I stop lifting weights for two weeks, then I've got a whole mental thing that I'm gonna to have to overcome to try to get back in the gym. And maybe I will or maybe I won't, right? The idea is you never forget how to ride a bike. You do, right? If you got on it now, you might be really terrible if you haven't ridden in 30 years or plus. So things do get worse and harden. And so if we reach a part where we're hardened of heart, as the Bible uses it, and that's where Francis came up with this idea, Here's what he says, quote, if one prays very little, it becomes so difficult to pray, and sensing the difficulty, prayer is abandoned forever according to the law of least resistance. 800 years ago, a saint tells us, this is what's gonna happen. 
It's no different than anything else in life. If you give it up, you'll finally just give it up. So the more we pray, the more we want to pray. The less we pray, the less we want to pray. Third one, the more we pray, the more God is within us. Now, by within us, we mean personally, relationally. God is infinite. God is no less in the sinner in hell than he is with the most blessed in heaven. God is not more with you than with me. He is with us exactly the same. The issue is not on God's half, it's on ours. It is we who determine how intimate God can be with us. That's where the, quote, degrees of prayer come from. They don't come from God. He's the same to everyone. They come from us to the extent we're able to surrender ourselves to him. So if we, by our faith and charity, become more and more intimate with him, this constant life of prayer makes God more real to us. It makes him into someone with whom we interact, through whom we share life and the things that go on in life. God becomes for us a living, vibrant, concrete reality. That's what he is. And so, and that helps us to want to be more with him, etc. Again, we have the converse, number four. The less we pray, the less God is within us. Again, not literally, but in relationally. Um, at that point, the less we pray, uh, the less sense God really makes to us after a time. And the less sense God makes to us, the more God becomes a meaningless idea. And then when the winds of change of life come and hit you, you're not going to turn to God. Why? Because nobody ever thinks an idea can save, relate, or help them. Right? If you've lost that, you no longer have a relationship with a living person. You have an idea. And the idea never helps us in the end. And so you're basically collapse unless you're able to somehow regain that aspect of your life. Um, and then the final one is just the final culmination of that. I don't know why there's actually five instead of four. Because the last one just explains the ending of the fourth one. If we stop praying, completely stop, then God simply ends up being a nobody. Now, I want to quote from a, another Franciscan author, a man who's who passed away now. Um, his name was, uh, he was a Capuchin. His name was Ignacio Lorniega. He was a Spanish-born Franciscan. He moved to South America two years after being ordained at like 21 years of age and never again left. He remained in South America for 70-something years till his death. Uh, unfortunately, in the English-speaking world, we're not that familiar with him. But if you mention him to a lot of Spanish speakers, they'll know his name right away. Only about seven of his books have been translated into English, except for the ones in print. You can't find them for less than about a hundred and something dollars on eBay and Amazon. Right? He is a popular author. Now, he wrote a book on Franciscan prayer in 1979. It was translated into English in 1989. But here's what he said in 1979, which kind of shows how things never change. Here's what he says. Um, if I can find it. The emptiness of God weighs on some people heavily. That's why we argue, question, discuss as never before prayer. The nature for it, the need for it. Naively, priests ramble on about new forms of prayer, saying this, demythologization, this, that. Prayer is criticized and intellectualized, and this is a very bad sign. Those who feel empty because they have abandoned God by abandoning prayer, he's talking about Christians, not non-Christians, they replace him with ideology. They feel the need for self-affirmation by getting involved in other activities such as politics. Now, at his time, he was there at the birth of what you may remember was called liberation theology, which was a connection of Marxism with Catholicism in some weird mixture in, in South America to try to help the plight of the poor. Uh, Lauren Yeager saw it and said, no, 
No way. Um, and it's interesting then what he tells us. He says, such people who do this never talk about eternal life, the soul, or God anymore. Rather, they only speak about suffering, human, uh, human charity, and social injustice. Then he gives us a nice little quote. Now, this is back from 79. I don't know what it would be today. He says, sociological studies done by the Vatican tell us that priests like this always end up as lay people. Right? They eventually leave the faith because an ideology can't replace religion. Um, so Lauren Yeager really takes to task this idea. And here's what he says. He says, what will happen to the life of the Christian whom God has now grown weak through lack of prayer? They will certainly continue to talk about God, but they will be un incapable of speaking will God, with God. If the person is a priest or member of the hierarchy, the faithful upon meeting him will say, we were looking for a prophet, but we only found a professional or a professor. <laughs> Those who have not taken God seriously will not take anything seriously. Deep within, they're frivolous and nothing is important to them. Neither the poor, the sick, the oppressed, nor even friends. They speak much, they do nothing. Uh, a famous Franciscan quote, those who are spiritual but not religious are never found in soup kitchens. Um, nothing will be important to them. They will only be important to themselves. It is always more comfortable and easy and less committing for us to deal with our own selves than to deal with God who meets us and unmasks everything we have, everything we do, and everything we are. God is something serious, the most serious thing in life. But these people opt rather for being distracted. So the, the understanding of prayer is, is incredibly important to what we do. So with that, looking at the catechism now, it now starts to define for us, what is prayer? And it's interesting that it starts without using a specific paragraph. It gives us a quote from uh, St. Uh, Therese of Lisieux. So what is prayer? And then quoting the saint, it says, for me, prayer is a surge of the heart. It is a simple look toward, turned toward heaven. It is a cry of recognition and of love, embracing both trial and joy. Okay, so Therese gives us this description. Now, her description highlights four things about prayer that we'll see as we go through the whole uh, chapter. Number one, Therese tells us that prayer engages the deepest part of the human being. It's a surge of the heart. And we'll understand what the term heart means in the Bible sense in a little bit. But it comes from the deepest part of who we are, our true self, you could say. Number two, prayer gazes upon the beauty of God in awe and wonder, right? A simple look turned toward heaven. As Paul says, keep your eyes fixed on what is above, not on what is below. And so Therese takes that into consideration. Number three, prayer is a calling out to the Lord as the one whom we desire. Quote, a cry of recognition and love is how she puts it. And then four, prayer encompasses every area of one's life. Embrace, as she puts it, quote, embracing both trial and joy. Right? We're so used to it, and maybe we grew up with it or just to practice it so long, we sometimes forget how big a deal prayer is, at least Christian prayer. Christian prayer is an unimaginable privilege that we just take for granted because in it, what we are saying in prayer, the church teaches, in prayer, you and I connect person to big P person, God. We ourselves connect to the creator and source of all existence. And he invites us to enter into a personal relationship with him, allows us to speak to him directly, and answers us as well, right? Prayer is this deep intimacy with God. And no matter what our other reasons for praying are, and there's a lot of them, right? 
Maybe I'm praying because I'm having an interpersonal relationship problem that I want help with. Maybe I'm praying for a job. Maybe I'm praying out of suffering. Maybe I'm simply praying because I was taught to as a kid and I don't know what else to do. All those are fine, but prayer should ultimately be progressing to this ultimate idea, which is um, we are there to become intimate with God. Right? That's to what all prayer is ultimately leading. So, for example, throughout the Psalms, you have all these, these statements, right? Um, As the deer longs for springs of water, so I thirst for you, my God. I, I thirst for you, the living God. Um, God, it's you I seek. For you, my body yearns. My heart trembles. When can I look upon you? I feel like I'm in a parched, thirst, lifeless land. Your love is better than life. You have all these different things that come up that we've just heard so often they don't affect us. Realizing that God himself, the creator, has called you not only to exist, but to have a personal relationship with him that he ultimately hopes will result one day in you literally sharing in his own divine Trinitarian life. Right? That's what Christian prayer ultimately is. And so at this point, after having given us this one definition of prayer, it'll give us a few more, it now breaks prayer into being into three main aspects. So you see there are three um, paragraphs on prayer as God's gift. Then there's going to be um, three paragraphs on prayer as a covenant, and then three paragraphs as prayer as a communion. So let's kind of look at what each of these says. Now before we do that, let's stop for a minute. And are there questions so far on what we've said about prayer, either the catechism or what the saints have mentioned? Anything? Okay, if there is, just let me know at any time you want. So let's go through them in order. Prayer is God's gift. Um, and what it does for this first section, interestingly enough, is that it, it focuses these three, three paragraphs under the idea of God's gift on a story in Scripture. The story of Jesus meeting the Samaritan woman at the well. So let's... We'll read them in the catechism, and then we'll go back and see some of the things I point out about them. So number 2559, prayer is the raising of one's mind and heart to God or the requesting of good things from God. So it starts by giving us a second definition right away, a more, quote, techno, uh, theological one. But when we pray, do we speak from the height of our pride and will or out of the depths of a humble and contrite heart? He who humbles himself will be exalted. Humility is the foundation of prayer. Only when we acknowledge that we do not know how to pray as we ought, are we ready to freely receive the gift of prayer. Man is a beggar before God. So it introduced the idea of humility, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But then the next two have to do with the story of the woman at the well. If you knew the gift of God, that's one of the phrases Jesus says to the Samaritan woman. The wonder of prayer, and if, you know, parts of the catechism, the different parts were written by different people. The section on prayer was written by a French um, Catholic priest named Jean Corbon. And when you read section four, if you've read the other sections, you know that he's the, he's the poet among them. Um, because this doesn't sound like a dry catechism paragraph. This sounds like how Father Corbon was, this deep mystic. Literally a year to the day after writing the, this and before it was even published, um, he ministered in Beirut as a Frenchman, French priest. He was killed by stepping on a landmine. So Father Corbon has died, and this was his last big thing to the world. But it's almost poetic. He says, um, the wonder of prayer is revealed beside the well where we come seeking water. There, Christ comes to meet every human being. It is he who first seeks us and asks us for a drink. Jesus thirsts. His asking arises from the depths of God's desire for us. Whether we realize it or not, prayer is the encounter of God's thirst with ours. God thirsts that we may thirst for him. So... Um, 
using this image of the woman at the well, he kind of puts us in the place of the woman, right? We come to the well seeking water, water always being the symbol of the Holy Spirit in Old and New Testament. We come speaking, seeking that life, whatever it is that we're missing, the answers to our questions. All these. We come to the well. And when we get there, Jesus comes to meet us there. And notice, it is he who first seeks us and asks us for a drink. Remember, he asked the woman, right, can you get me a drink? Only twice in his life does Jesus say he thirsts. Here, and what's the other one? On the cross. On the cross. It's not accidental, this idea of his thirsting for us. But he goes on to say something very important. He says, he first seeks us. That's true. God's always the one who's initiative. He asks us for a drink. It's, it might be weird to think of the fact how much God wants you. Right? God doesn't love you in some kind of theoretical, philosophical sense. He doesn't love, quote, humanity. He loves each and individual human being that he has created. And he loves them intimately and passionately. And here Corbon is trying to get that across right at the very beginning of the section on prayer. That... As much as you think you want and desire God, God wants you far more. Now, that's a mystery because we don't know why. He doesn't need us in the sense that I need God or even need other human beings. God isn't completed by anything I add to him. He truly, his love is truly unconditional because he gets nothing from it except that he wants it because he created us, right? It it doesn't, his love doesn't really ultimately make sense to us. It's so beyond what we understand. Why would an infinite, already perfect God who needs nothing else, why, right? What does he want from us? He just wants to love us because he chose to and made us. So, but it, it, it is astounding to think about it. It's, why is Jesus thirsty? And he's obviously speaking in a spiritual sense now. Why does he want the woman of Samaria. Why does he want us? It's because Jesus' thirst comes from the depths of God's desire for us, the catechism says. Jesus came in the first place because God desires us. Right? Everything he's ever done from the beginning of creation is because he wants us to be intimate and passionate with him as he is with us. And so it, that, that um, paragraph ends with that sort of mystery. It says, whether we realize it or not, prayer is the encounter of God's thirst with ours, right? These two desires. I'm desiring something for God. I'm looking for God. God was already looking for me and waiting. God thirsts that we may thirst for him. Right? It's his desire for us that is implanted within us from the moment of our existence, the desire for him. What uh, St. Augustine you know, talks about in his famous quote, you have made us for yourself, right? and we are restless until we rest in you. It's that same idea, but, but taken in a, in a sort of different direction here. So he starts with that, and then he continues in 2561 with that same image of the woman at the well. He said, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Paradoxically, our prayer of petition is a response to the plea of the living God. And then he quotes the the, the prophet, or God speaking to the prophet Jeremiah. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Prayer is the response of faith to the free promise of salvation and also response of love to the thirst of the only Son of God. So prayer is not simply some kind of duty we have to do. It's not just a commandment we have to do. In fact, as Judaism pointed out long ago, there are 613 commands in the Old Testament. Not one of them says you have to pray. Why is that? Because prayer is the prerequisite for any of them. Because if you don't pray, then your faith is suspect, and so who cares what you do? It's not done out of love for God or his glory. And so in the same way, the New Testament um, rarely speaks about it. Paul tells us to pray, and ceaselessly. 
But the point being, ultimately, prayer is supposed to um, facilitate this personal, deeply personal, and passionate relationship with us. That God is not, you know, as we may sometimes see him, we almost think of God in some deistic or almost paganistic ways, that God is so far beyond us, he kind of is unconcerned, right? He gave us the rules to follow, and he just wants to make sure we do, and if we do, we get rewarded. But that's not at all what the Judeo-Christian faith says. It says God is passionately involved in every single thing going on in life, drawing us to himself, wanting us to a relationship with himself, to the point where an infinite God, in some ways, actually hurt when we reject or rebel against him. He gets angry. Why? Because he's angry that we've chosen to deny him. Again, it, it's, it's a mystery you can't fully grasp, but it's there clearly on every, on every page of Scripture. And so here at the beginning, it's talking about prayer is God's gift, and it gives us kind of these three um, aspects. Now, looking at the handout, and then we'll open to questions for these three before we go on to the covenant part. It started, remember, by giving us another definition of prayer right away, a more theological one from the fathers of the church, uh, St. John of Damascus. Prayer is the raising of one's mind and heart to God or the requesting of good things from God. Again, each, each of these definitions gives us a little more insider way to look at to prayer. And so what are the purposes of prayer? Uh, St. John Damascene gives us two. Content contemplation, right? uniting ourselves with God. That's what it means to raise one's mind and heart to God. Is to place myself in the presence of the Lord, to know before who am I standing, and to just stand there sort of in wonder and worship. At the same time, and this is where the second two paragraphs take off from, the church never um, speaks of intercession and petition as being sort of meaningless, right? There's an idea that we might come to uh, assume that because the, the point of it all is intimacy that, you know, we always hear, um, well, you know, we shouldn't ask for so many things. Our prayer should be this and that and the other. And that's true. We should have a deeper and deeper, more prayer life. But never do we stop asking. The very asking is something God wants from us, the church says here. right? In this intercession, the way it says, um, it says, uh, our prayer of petition, 2561, prayer of petition or intercession, when praying petition for someone else, is a response to the plea of the living God. God wants us to love him enough that we turn to him for what we need. What he doesn't want is for us to turn to everything else, and then when nothing else works, as a last resort, we say, all right, maybe you can do it for me. Right? That's using him simply utilitarian. But if we turn to him in honesty, acknowledging that I am not my own, you know, be, I didn't bring myself into existence, I have no control in the sense of my ultimate destiny, that I can't control the aspects of my life, but I know you love me and I trust you and so I'm going to ask you, that's different. And when we practice that kind of petition and intercessory prayer, even that quote, lowest form of prayer is still something that brings us to God. So really quick, let me just um, uh, look at something real. He mentions humility. Do we speak from the height of pride, et cetera? The humble person alone is able to enter into relationship with God. Why? Because only the humble person recognizes that in and of themselves, they cannot enter into God's presence. There is nothing I can do by my own work, will, power, or authority to make God let me enter his presence. I have to rely and can only rely on his grace in order to do that. It is solely through him that he enables me to have a relationship with him, right? Jesus, apart from me, you can do nothing. And nothing means nothing. Not a little bit, not halfway to heaven, not almost to the gates, nothing. Without the divine grace, you're not even moving beyond this earth in any way towards him. Um, it may sound odd to think of prayer as a gift because we often 
to our own minds seem to be the ones initiating everything. But in fact, even the desire to pray is already a grace God has put in our hearts. We didn't just come up with it on our own. He gives us the desire for him. Whether we respond to it or not still is up to us, but we have the desire already from him. The technical term is prevenient grace. But here's what Paul says. Look what he says about it. He says, I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work in you will continue to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. Well, the one who began the good work is God. For God is the one who, for his good purpose, works in you both to desire and to work. Did you catch that? It's him who even gives you the desire to want to do this, and then he's the one who enables you to do it. So what do we do in the process? All we do is say yes. That's it. And then follow through what that yes means. But we don't, aren't the ones who determine it. We aren't the ones who dictate it. It all comes from that. And one of the things we need to grasp is the church is clear on this, and this is a difficult one, and we can talk about this after the, the break, but that last sentence of that paragraph, our prayers only have any merit to the extent that they are directed, they're united to and directed by the Holy Spirit. Any, quote, natural prayer doesn't mean anything. The only prayers that actually pierce heaven, so to speak, are those that come from the power of the Holy Spirit in our union with him in some way. Um, and so there, the Spirit, again, is going to be this important aspect of what happens in Christian prayer. Okay, let's take our break, and then we'll come back, and we'll um, just finish this little part and ask if there's questions, and then move into the last parts of covenant and uh, communion. So we're turning back and just go over this section, then we'll answer questions if there's any. Going back to this idea of humility, where it starts with humility is really the ground of everything. Um, humiliatus in Latin comes from the word uh, humus, not the stuff you put pita in, but it literally means the ground in Latin. And so a humble person is one who is grounded, literally we would say. What are they grounded? They're grounded in reality. What does that mean? They know who God is, and they know who they are, both good and bad traits, in light of who God is. So in other words, the humble person is, is real. They're realistic. They're ground in reality. Now, it is important to recognize that outside of the Judeo-Christian tradition, in the ancient world, the Greco-Roman world, humility was not a virtue. Right? It is referred to as Aristotle, humility is a slave virtue. Right? Now, I would say in the modern Western world, it's also still seen as a slave virtue. We, we speak about it, how we should all be humble, but I don't think many people really are. Right? Or they claim they are, and then the moment the slightest thing happens to them and they explode. Right, So humility is really rooted, it's not a... It's not a false view of oneself. It's not pretending you don't have any gifts or importance. It's not thinking you're worthless. It's knowing who you really are in light of God. You're a beloved son or daughter of God, but you also have problems that you really need for God to help you overcome and to perfect you. But so you're grounded. You're, you're rooted in reality in your relationship with God. So that's what um, the this that humility really is when we're talking about humility in the prayer in the uh, church talks about that um, it then goes on to those two paragraphs um, which I quote again on the next page but I've already mentioned just like the Samaritan woman we too the way it's portrayed in the, in the catechism quote come seeking water to meet Christ there beside the well Right? And we see that that symbol of water is that of the Holy Spirit throughout sacred scripture. Right? Jesus and, the, and his famous uh, Feast of Tabernacles speech says, quote, Let anyone who thirsts come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture says, rivers of living water will flow from within him. That's what Jesus says. Then John, writing the gospel, 
tells all of us what that means. John says, he said this in reference to the spirit that those who came to believe in him were to receive. Right? So the water is that, I mean, it's the spirit that really connects us to Christ, who then connects us to the Father. So that seeking the water, seeking being by the well, is just trying to, you know, enter into this, this thirst we have, this longing, this yearning that you hear about in the Psalms of what is missing in my life, or what's going on, or I really want to experience more deeply the, the, the God and the Creator. And so that's why, you know, the Catechism says his asking, his thirst, arises from God's desire for us. As much as we long for God, he longs for us infinitely more. In fact, he loved us before we even existed in the plan he had. So at the last part of that um, paragraph, you have this statement from Paul. He says, Blessed be the Lord, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ, with every spiritual blessing in the heavens. Now, I just point that out. It's not part of the prayer part, but it's important to realize that a shift has occurred between Old and New Testament. In the beginning of the Old Testament and through partial parts of the narrative, wealth was a sign of God's blessing. Then as you start to hit the wisdom writings, Proverbs, Sirach, Job, and then into the prophets, you recognize that little by little, that's not true. That's not necessarily true anymore. And now, by the New Testament, it's been completely turned over. Not that, not that material blessings are never blessings from God, but God doesn't promise those. But He does promise the spiritual blessings: peace, joy, love, confidence, fulfillment, all those kind of things. So He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens. Now, notice. As he, God the Father, chose us, you and I, in him, Jesus, before the foundation of the world. Biblical language for before he created anything. So before, quote, day one of creation, you are already part of the plan. Right? No one is here by accident. No one is not here who's not meant to be here. We are all purposely planned out of God's love to be here. And so as much as we love God, the scriptures continually tell us God loves us far more than we can ever really understand. Um, and so prayer is described here as this encounter between two thirsts or two desires or two passions, God's and ours. And because God is the one who created us, he has planted within us a desire from he, for him from the very beginning. I quoted this earlier from Augustine. Um, St. Augustine describes it. Quote, here's the whole quote. You are great, O Lord, and greatly to be praised. Great is your power and your wisdom is without measure. And man, so small a part in your creation, wants to praise you. This man, though clothed in mortality and bearing the evidence of sin and the proof that you withstand the proud, despite everything, man, though but a small part of your creation, wants to praise you. You yourself encourage him to delight in your praise, for you have made us for yourself, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. Literally, the first paragraph of the first sentence of the first chapter in his book, um, The Confessions. So this is how he starts his entire autobiography, which, by the way, is the first autobiography in human history. There are a lot of biographies written by other people. So Suetonius writes about 12 Caesars. But Augustine was the first human being in history that we know of to have written a story about his own life personally. Uh, and part of that is due to the Christian influence. Right? If, if each of us is this infinitely loved and desired thing made purposely by God, then it means that what we have to talk about is actually important. Right? Our lives have meaning, and they might be able to help others and, and guide them in that meaning. So God loves us more than we love ourselves, and he wants us more than we, love our, than we want ourselves. Right? He's our greatest 
one who desires and is our cheerleader and everything else. Then it says, paradoxically, our prayer petition is a response to that, right? God, as I mentioned before the break, he loves to answer our prayers and our petitions and fulfill our needs because he loves us. He wants to do that. And it's only God who can fulfill our every longing. Our prayer, not created things. Those are the, quote, broken cisterns, right? They can't ultimately fulfill us. They can give us joy and pleasure for a time, but ultimately they're going to run out. Only he has that, that ability to fulfill us absolutely. And so our prayer, Christian prayer, arises from our faith in the promises of Christ and our love in response to his passionate love for us. And so it is important that prayer and faith have this intimately close bond with one another. Um, faith is really a prerequisite for true prayer, although the two exist in this great union. Deep prayer can only spring from a living faith, and similarly, our faith can only become more vibrant and active the more that we continually pray um, and nourish it by prayer. And so prayer is not an option for the Christian who truly wants to live their faith. Uh, in fact, as Romano Gardini, a famous author of um, Pre-Vatican II said, prayer is the most fundamental expression of faith. It is communion with God in whom our faith is centered. And so just to step back for a moment from the handout again, it's important to realize this, that if faith and prayer are so inextricably bound, then what is this faith we're talking about? It's not any faith. It's not just good hoping in something or I believe in anything. The content of your faith is ultimately what matters. Right? Faith the size of a mustard seed, if it's in Jesus. <laughs> you could have huge faith in something else and it'll fail you because it can't live up to your expectations. So what is faith when the, we're talking about it? Well, there's only one definition of faith given in the entire Bible. In the 11th chapter of Hebrews, the very first verse has this interesting statement. It says, faith is the realization of what is hoped for and evidence of things not seen. Notice, realization, evidence. Faith is not a maybe. Faith is a guarantee that's deeper than sort of our, our rational thinking and such. The church then goes on to explain that in more detail. Um, if, if you do have your, not the catechism part I brought, but if you, you know, you might want to bring a catechism with you in, in a Bible if you can. Um, in the catechism, it then, number 142 and 143 of the catechism, we have this um, definition of faith. But first it describes the inter, this interaction between us and God. It says, by his revelation, so God showing himself to us, the invisible God from the fullness of his love, again, it's all out of his love and desire for us, addresses humanity as his friends and moves among them in order to invite and receive them into his own company, right? Christ came, why God revealed himself through the patriarchs, then through Israel, and then ultimately in Jesus in the most perfect way is that God's whole purpose is to bring us into his own life, a relationship with him. The Catechism goes on to say the adequate response to this invitation is faith. And then it, then it gives another little definition of faith. By faith, man completely submits his intellect and his will to God. With his whole being, man gives his assent to God. Scripture calls this human response to God the obedience of faith. Right? Faith always includes the response that you do what the word of God asks of you. And we see that later. It says the word obey is a Latin term, just like humility, from ob adire, means to hear and respond. And it means that 
in faith, we freely submit by our own choice, not because we're forced to or someone tells us we have to or we need to or we're going to go to hell if we don't, but we freely choose to respond to what God has said because we believe in God who is true. And then the Catechism says, Abraham is the model of such obedience that is offered to us in Scripture, and the Virgin Mary is its most perfect embodiment. Right? Abraham is told as an old man, pick up everything and leave. And what does he do? He goes without asking question. Mary, you're going to give birth you know, as a virgin to the Messiah and such. Let it be done to me according to thy word. Right? That's the faith, the obedience that comes out of faith. Now, they then give an extended definition a little bit later. And I don't want to get too caught up in the section on um, this part of faith, but it does say a few things important. It says, faith is first of all, so notice there's a dual part. Faith is first of all a personal adherence, that means to cling to, of man to God. At the same time and inseparably, it's a free assent to the whole truth God has revealed. So faith, real faith, Christian faith, has two dimensions. There is an objective dimension, which is um, uh, doctrinal. We say yes to everything God has said. Yes to his word. But more importantly, there's a subjective component, our personal component. And that's where we cling to him. That is, we say yes to God himself. Not just what he said, but we seek to know and love him more personally. So you notice, faith is first of all, so even more importantly, a personal, personal adherence, clinging of man to God. At the same time, and inseparably, you can't have that without this, it's also a yes to everything that the whole truth that God has revealed. So in, in the terms we hear it bandied about today in modern times, this is what the word spiritual means, and this is what the word religious means. And so in the church's understanding of what real faith is, can you be spiritual and not be religious? No. Because otherwise, if you're just this, you're making it up as you go along. You decide your own. Right, you decide your own thing. Yeah. And so without any objective grounding, what's to keep you more to anything real about God or anything else? And you'll notice these people rarely talk about anything like judgment, anger, yeah. repentance. There's none of that ever. Right? You, get, you generally get rid of everything that's somewhat unpleasant to what we don't like. So real faith involves both. It has to have this dimension, or else, um, or else it simply becomes sort of servitude, right? We're just carrying out obediently commands and rules. On the other hand, if, uh, similarly, if, it, if, it, um, if it's only um, this without that, it becomes very sentimental and kind of you know, self-absorbed, really, that people are not really focused on deeper things like that. Does religion um, give uh, discipline also? Is yeah, it kind of gives the structure of what it is. And just like faith and prayer in general, within faith itself, these two kind of play off each other. Right? Mm -hmm. The more I know about God, the more I can then enter into a closer relationship with him. And then the closer I become to him, the more I understand and grasp the things about him, the mysteries of faith and why he asks us to do what he asks of us and things like that. So there's this constant interplay between the two. All of us are more of one than the other at any given time, but as long as they're kind of being held in that, in that uh, tension of the whole focus of faith, then we're good. Um, it'll then say two other important things about faith, because I'm going to skip most of the big definition. It says, for a Christian, believing in God can never be separated from believing in the one he sent, Jesus. Right? Our faith is not vague or generic. It is a very specific faith. 
It is faith in Jesus Christ as the um, incarnate Son of God, raised, uh, died and raised. So it's very specific of what faith means. It's not any faith I have. It's not any faith in God I want. It's what God himself has revealed it in and through. So we have faith is both spiritual and religious, but its focus is on the person of Jesus. And then because he has seen the Father, we're told Jesus Christ is the only one who knows him and re can reveal him to us. And then the third component is all of this takes place in the context of the Holy Spirit. We do not give ourselves faith. The best I can do is sort of begin to approach the understanding of what faith is in order to make that final leap, which God has to do. Now, even in that process, the church would say, the reason you're even seeking out faith, the reason you're even like studying religions or whatever you're doing, is because God is already touching you and calling you towards that. So it's still not you, ultimately. It's just your response at that point towards it. But in order for this faith to become this saving faith, where it's a real personal relationship, where our acts and our things have merit because we're united with Christ, all of that ultimately comes down to the Spirit. So all three members of the Trinity, we have both the objective part of it and the teachings, we have the subjective personal aspect of it, and they all go into what faith means for us. And so this is sort of that prerequisite for prayer, because then when we enter into prayer, on one hand, we're entering in what should be more and more a personal, intimate relationship with the Lord. But we also, as we enter into that relationship and we draw closer to him, we want to know his will more, we want to obey his will more, and there, therefore this takes on a different dimension as we begin to actually live it out not see it as rules or things we have to just obey in order to like be saved or go to heaven or however we understand it, but as the response to this more and more um, personal, intimate relationship that we're having with the Lord. So prayer itself is kind of part of this whole process that's um, continuing in us from faith to um, deeper prayer, then our prayer turns around and strengthens our hope, so that more and more we're becoming um, these people of deep prayer. Okay, so that's the first part. Prayer is God's gift, and now we're going to look at prayer's covenant. But before we do, on those paragraphs, 2559 through 2561, any questions about prayer as God's gift that we mentioned? Yeah? Can, can an atheist pray? Possibly. <laughs> uh, they can always pray. That's one of the... One of the things is um, that the church would say is the Holy Spirit is everywhere, and the Holy Spirit is in some manner working on every human being in order to draw them in some way closer and closer to Christ. Um, so an atheist who really finds themselves searching or at a complete loss and is truly open to figuring out if God is, is true or real or not. Yes, if it's coming from a place of their heart, then even though they wouldn't explain it this way, and even though they wouldn't even necessarily believe it, it's coming from a place of grace. Um, and so yes, if they're asking for things like that, God will answer their prayers. Now, if they're asking for material things and such, the church says, no, God doesn't hear them at all. He what just lets that? his providence take its, its delay, its way. What yeah. about from an intellectual point of view? Because you haven't really mentioned intellectual as far as from a, from a human point of view in this in this prayer sequence. Uh, intellectual in is in far in so far as as that that you can that you can figure it out that you can understand the what what a god is or what something that is superior. Right. Um, well, yeah. Ultimately, what it uh, what's going to happen. It for the atheist is at a certain point they're going to have to reach that that critical choice of can they from what they do know and as much as their reason is able to to take them so far are they able 
to trust in some way that I'm at least going to make an assumption that what I can know of God is true and therefore I'm going to try to enter into this relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there has to be um, some level of trust that ultimately goes beyond our, our rational um, thinking. Because the intellect itself and uh, can know a lot. I mean, I mentioned USD earlier. I had several teachers at USD um, who were atheists. They made no bones about it. They were atheists. They knew the Bible better than I probably ever will, but none of it had any impact on their, their life. So it's just an academic the, thing. Right, it's just academic. So uh, the other thing to recognize in, in any of these cases is God is omniscient. He knows every reason behind everything, which you and I never know. Right? Mm -hmm. He knows why the person is an atheist. He knows what it is that caused them to be an atheist. He knows all of that. And so in his own way, he's working with that person sort of behind the scenes, as well as bringing other people, including you and I, into their lives in some way mm -hmm. um, in order to kind of break that down. But anyone who thinks simply by their intellect alone they have some deep relationship with God, um, they don't. And James is probably the most direct about that. Now, the whole uh, Protestant Reformation versus Catholic thing, which we talk about as faith and works, but in one of the dimensions of that is for Catholics, we, we say faith and works, and by that, most of us mean what a Protestant means just by faith. For the Catholic, the faith part tends to focus more on that intellectual aspect. Faith is knowledge, because it is a type of knowledge, objectively. And the works aspect is sort of our response in, in the spiritual thing, that yes, I believe in this, and now it's shown through for my life. So it's my whole person. Um, at least the initial reformers tended to mean by faith kind of the whole thing. They focus more on the trust part. Um, now they did tend to deny to some extent, at least Luther did, the intellectual aspect because they were afraid precisely of that happening, that if you identify faith simply as intellectual knowledge, then that's not faith. Mm -hmm. And he was right, and the Catholic Church would agree 100% with that. If that's all you have, that's not faith. Right? There are a lot of people who teach world religions who know a lot of facts about every religion. They're not people of faith necessarily of any of them. Um, and James is the one who I said gives us the most like shocking kind of statement about that. Um, in James, if you have your Bibles, in, in James' letter, he talks about this where he says, let's see. Okay, in his section on faith and works, um, verse 19, chapter 2. So James chapter 2, verse 19, he's talking about faith and works. He started the whole thing with, what good is it if you have faith but don't have works? Can that faith save him? Well, he's really talking about intellectual faith or faith that doesn't move forward in any practical manner. Um, so faith of itself is dead. But here's where he says something interesting. He's... He's, atta he's, I guess ta attacking is the correct word. He's attacking those people who think simply having this intellectual faith is enough. And he says to them, um, you believe that God is one. You do well, right? Now this belief is an intellectual one. They've been taught, that's the Jewish understanding. God is one, not polytheistic. God is one. And even as Christians, we have one God in three persons. But then this is how he responds to that. Even the demons believe that and tremble. Mm -hmm. Right? The point is what? The demons know more about God than any of us until we're glorified. Right? They know more of him by intellectual nature from the moment. Satan knows more about God than I do. Is he saved by that knowledge? No. No. So the intellect alone in and of itself can never do that. That's why apologetics is important, but it's never the be all and end all. Because the reality is for most people, even if you could show them crossing every T, dotting every I, that God is a more rational choice through modern science and everything else, 
it doesn't mean they'll believe. Why? Because it isn't ultimately about their reason, it's about their lifestyle. Most people don't convert, not because they, have, they really are overwhelmingly convinced that science has disproven God. They might say that. What they really don't want to do is, I don't want to have to change my life because if I accept this idea about God, then what does that mean for me? Then I'm going to have to do this and X and Y and Z. And so a lot of it is much more a, an issue of the heart than it is ultimately the mind, although you know, we get through those, those discussions and, and struggles. Um, the other thing about it is faith doesn't doubt, but it will, real faith does um, have struggles throughout its entire existence, right? For our entire Christian life, we're going to struggle with things from time to time. Some we may have held without any question for most of our life, and then suddenly it'll happen, something will happen, and all of a sudden we'll look at it in a different light because usually it's some kind of tragedy or difficulty in life, and now we're questioning it and, and struggling with it. Um, and that's where hope comes in. And you'll notice in the initial definition, it included hope within it. It was interestingly it said the realization of what is hoped for. Realization making it real here and now uh, for what is coming in the future. So um, the faith has all these different dimensions to it. Uh, other thing about the faith is a divine gift. Okay, let's look at the second one. Prayer is a covenant. And that one also has three paragraphs. It says, number, the first one, 2562. Where does prayer come from? Whether prayer is expressed in words or gestures, it is the whole man, the whole person who prays. But in naming the source of prayer, Scripture speaks sometimes of the soul or the spirit, but most often of the heart, more than a thousand times. According to Scripture, it is the heart that prays. If our heart is far from God, the words of prayer are in vain. So the second big category of prayer is that of a covenant. And just briefly, as I point out here, without getting into the whole story of the covenant, the entire theme of sacred scripture is, is, revolves around this concept of a covenant. The covenant, I put the technical term and then I explain it. A covenant is an oath and a ritualized promise that creates a bond of blood kinship between two persons, the two persons involved, in resulting in a new and personal relationship by joining two separate persons into one single entity. In other words, in common terms, what does a covenant do? It makes a family. It creates a family. So marriage and adoption are the ones our culture still has that give us an idea of a covenant. And that's the heart of God's plan for humanity is to bring us into his own life for all eternity by the power of grace, right? Without going into any of these in detail, the story is Adam is created to be God's son and through him by created, not like Jesus is by nature, but created to be the son of, the son of God. And through him, all of humanity was meant to enter into this relationship, usually referred to as a marriage in the scriptures, a covenant, um, and that's the key to the whole covenant of God. So what does the church say about it? It says Christian prayer, if you look at 2564, Christian prayer is a covenant relationship between God and man in Christ. It is the action of God and man springing forth from both the Holy Spirit and ourselves, wholly directed to the Father in union with the human will of the Son of God made man. So one of the parts of the covenant dimension of prayer that we need to realize is that prayer is a synergy. Although we hear that term all the time now, we don't know it's a Greek theological term. That's where it came from. Sin ergos, work together. Salvation is a working together between us and the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit, God, has 99.9% .9 of the work but we still have to do our 0.001%. We have to say yes. We have to respond. We have to actively in some way try to engage that. So the way it describes it says it's this combined action of the spirit 
our spirit with God's spirit that is, quote, wholly directed to the Father. And the spirit enables us to reach the Father only because it has united us to the sacred humanity of Jesus, which enables us to follow God's will. Right? It's, uh, he, as it says, it's the action of God and man springing from both the Holy Spirit and ourselves, wholly directed to the Father in union, because of the Spirit, with the human will of the Son of God made man. Notice his will, in, order, in other words, brings that obedience in as well, and faith and such again. Um, so, for example, in the book of Hebrews, we have this, this statement where he says, quote, Through the blood of Jesus, we have confidence of entrance into the sanctuary, that's the heavenly presence of God the Father, um, into the sanctuary by the new and living way he opened for us through the veil that is his flesh. So where the Old Testament, the ark of God where he was present, was protected by this huge curtain and veil which was torn at Jesus' death. It is Jesus' flesh. It's through his flesh that we enter heaven as through a door. Think of the mass. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. That's how we enter heaven. No other way except with, through, and in Christ by the power of the Spirit that's united us to him. So, what the church here is saying, though, is God is the one who initiates, accompanies, and brings to fulfillment all our prayers. However, we can never forget that our cooperation is still absolutely essential in order for our prayer and ultimately our salvation to be effective. Um, now, because prayer is a covenant bond, it involves that deepest depths of the human person. That's what it was talking about in that first paragraph about the heart over a thousand times. Well, in 2563, the very, that middle paragraph, it actually explains what the heart is um, in terms of the biblical understanding. And here we have to be careful because in our culture, when we think about the heart, we tend to not think of it in the biblical sense. We think about it in the pagan Roman sense, where the heart is the place of emotion, and affection, right? Valentine's Day, what do we have everywhere? Hearts. That's not the Bible at all. In fact, the, the Bible sees the place of love as the intestines. You don't know that because the way we translated it, we just say, you know, from my inside or from my interior life, but it literally in Hebrew says the intestines. So for the Hebrew mind, the heart has nothing to do with emotions. So we have to first get rid of that idea so that we can understand what it is. And so here, sort of on a mini tiny Bible study, the church gives us what does the heart mean when it talks about the heart in the Bible. So it says, the heart is the dwelling place where I am, where I live according to the Semitic or biblical expression, the heart is the place to which I withdraw. The heart is our hidden center, right? It's your, your true self. Or when Paul talks about the spirit versus the flesh, the flesh is that false part of you that you've adopted and lived by. The spirit is that true person of you made in the divine image of God. The heart is our hidden center beyond the grasp of our reason and of others. Others can never fully comprehend us. Even people who've known us our whole lives in the closest relationship, there's still a mystery about us. Right? And I'm sure all of you, have, <laughs> your kids, your parents, your spouse at certain points in your life have done things that you're like, I never would have seen that, right? Not necessarily bad, but just I never would have thought of that. So we're, we're never fully visible to the other person because the heart is this sort of secretive place, this hidden center. Only the spirit of God can fathom the human heart and know it fully. So what, what happens in the quote heart? The heart is the place of decision. So notice it's a place where we make choices. Deeper than our psychic drives. Again, it's the true self, the core of who you really are in the image and likeness of God. It is the place of truth where we choose life or death. So that's the ultimate decision we make. For God or against him. 
right, as he told externally to Israel, today I set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. The blessing if you obey my commands and cling to me, the curse if you turn to other gods and follow them. Therefore, choose life. Right? What God said to everyone externally in Israel is going on in each of our own hearts all the time. Choosing between life and death, flesh versus spirit. It's the place of encounter because as image of God, we live in relation. It is the place of covenant. So it's where God truly speaks to us and is present to us in the most vibrant way. However, as John of the Cross says, because it's this hidden place, until we reach a pretty high level of spiritual maturity, you're not going to feel that. It'll be beyond your ability to even experience, but it's happening. And then as the person draws more and more closer through prayer, ultimately, they start to experience that on a more regular um, basis. So the idea is in scripture, Old and New Testament, it's the heart, our heart or our spirit, little s, united to the Holy Spirit. That's where real prayer comes from. Um, and the, the catechism elsewhere in another paragraph that's not in the section on prayer, but I thought I'd include it because it talks about this, says, quote, in naming the source of prayer, scripture speaks sometimes of the soul or of the spirit, but most often the heart. It's the heart that prays. It doesn't matter whether prayer is expressed in words or gestures. It's the whole man. So notice again, the heart is symbolic of the whole human person. And without getting into a big detailed thing, um, the fathers of the church spoke of how the heart applied to every aspect of us as people. Right? Our body, our soul, our spirit. Well, the heart, the physical heart, we know what that does. Right? It keeps us alive. It keeps blood pumping. Although we use brain death now, the reality is, is if your heart starts, stops beating unless someone artificially keeps it beating, you're going to be dead soon. So the heart is literally the core as our, in our, to look at our bodies, the, the source of where our life comes from physically. Similarly, when we die, the soul leaves the body. Therefore, the heart has some connection to keeping the soul in the body itself. And then ultimately, the, the heart is where the spirit and the spirit of God interconnect. So in some way, the heart understood in this totality, not just as this physical lump of muscle in your body, but it does have a connection to every part of the human person as they're understood by the Bible. So the heart is really the core of who you are, your true self, you made in the image and likeness of God that you're trying to sort of, that God is sort of um, like Jesus in the resurrection. He's sort of... Um, sanctifying you from the inside out right he's starting in the in the insides again and slowly he's going outward from the spirit to your mind and um, and intellect and will and choices and then ultimately in the resurrection your body will also be brought into that same um, sanctification that same holiness so the heart is is really our true self but although it, it only is one line it's an, an important one Prayer has to involve the whole person, the totality of the person, in order to be authentic. Right? That goes back to the first commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. All of you. Right? Everything you do has to ultimately do that. That's why um, the heart that prays, so any prayer that does not issue from the heart cannot in the end be real. Therefore, quote, if our heart is far from God, the words of our prayer are in vain. And an interesting thing to think of, not to get too involved in it, you don't want to become scrupulous, but it's to ask yourself, how many of your prayers are really authentic? <laughs> Sometimes we can't tell if they're authentic, but a lot of times we know which ones aren't. Right? The ones I'm throwing up just here or there, the ones I'm just doing because I, oh, I better do night prayers. I throw up grace before meals. Do I really think about it or is it just secondhand, right? 
Am I praying my rosary and I sound more like a cattle call and there's no, you know. How often are our prayers really authentic? Or at least we hope they are and struggle for them to be. Um, that's something that you can take from this idea of, you know, trying to, to pray with, from the heart with your whole person. From the heart means also that you're really putting your, your mind and thought and everything in it. So the intellect here would, would connect, right? When I'm praying, am I thinking about the words I'm saying? Am I thinking about the Lord who I'm standing before, right? What is my point of view? Because again, to bring in Teresa of Avila is very interesting because she says she doesn't like, she doesn't like the way theologians divided up prayer, vocal prayer, meditation, contemplation. The reason she doesn't like it is this. She says, if by vocal prayer you mean you can talk to God without thinking about what you're saying, that's not prayer. She's very clear. That is not prayer. Even in the most simple vocal prayers, are you thinking about the words you're saying? The problem is we've become so used to them, we just say them by rote. Have you ever said the Our Father slowly? That's how, that's how Teresa encouraged her nuns to enter into meditation was to say each word of the Our Father so slowly that you had to reflect on every word. It might take you 20 minutes. And sometimes in the midst of that, you just got caught up by, because one of the things took you sort of into a, into a mystical experience of that. You know, even the sign of the cross, do you realize it means something, right? There's a way to do it. You have, you have your um, ring finger and your pinky are against the palm of your hand. That's the two natures of Jesus Christ. He's connected to the rest of the hand, which represents the Trinity, Father, Son, Spirit. You pinch your mouth. And then not only are you making the sign of the cross, which we say, and naming the Trinitarian people, but you're also telling the history of salvation. He came from heaven to earth and passed from death the left side, sinister, into life, right? In that one tiny prayer that we say, so we just, you know, don't think about it. Even that has a deep meaning to it. And so if anything else, the, the church here is just in, encouraging us, look, start taking your prayers seriously. It's better to say them slowly and understanding and mean them rather than just throw out tons and tons of stuff. The other thing I'd say about that is um, pray as, as you pray, not like somebody else. And that may seem funny, but a lot of times we pray like somebody else, right? We, we talk to God with language we wouldn't normally use. And it's not like God's tricked. He's like, oh, that guy's really eloquent now, right? No, he's just like, why are you talking like that? You never talk like that. Um, as a side, because we're, we're at our end, um, when I do spiritual direction, a lot of times you have people journal. Um, and people journal and the question will inevitably come at some point. Um, the things I'm journaling, you know, <laughs> is it really God? How do I know if it's God? Because it sounds like me, right? Because there's this idea we have that God speaking in the depths of our conscience or to our mind is going to sound more divine, right? But what does that mean? How would you expect God, who's speaking from within you, in your manner of understanding, why wouldn't he sound exactly like you? If he didn't, that's when you should start worrying. Right? He's going to speak to you as you would normally speak. And, so the, and the third part about that is, so be honest, because it's not like you trick God. Jews don't have a problem with this. Christians didn't used to, but over the centuries we have developed it, and the problem is this. We don't want to say anything bad to God because, you know, he's God. So we don't want to tell God, like almost every psalm says, you screwed me over. That's how I feel. Maybe you did or did, but that's how I feel. As if God can't handle it, right? Or he's going to get mad at you or something. No, we have to be honest and authentic. Now, if the only prayers you have are complaint, well, now you've got the problem, not God. But, you know, ask yourself, do I really say what I really want, or do I tell him what I think he wants to hear, which is ironic for an omniscient God, you can't trick him, right? You're like, oh, Lord, I, 
you know, and you're praying for these things that you really don't care. What you really want is to win the lottery or do this, you know, but you're not being honest. So it, it's that authenticity. It's try to really pray from the heart, realize whom you're standing in front of and whom you're, who you're speaking to and what you're saying in your prayers or in your thoughts if it's just quiet meditation. Um, speak just from the heart as you would normally speak and speak your authentic feelings and desires. And they might be bad ones sometimes. In that case, you know they're bad ones. You say, here's what I'm feeling, Lord. Could you please, please help me overcome this thing or you know, deal with this um, understanding? So, well, we didn't finish the communion. We'll get to that next time and then move on to the last, uh, the other two, 255, five, two, five, six, six, and 2567. And then the next section has to do with the Old Testament. So it's a history of prayer and we're, our prayer starts to build. You can see it through the history. Then it moves to Jesus and then it enters into the church where we start getting into more specifics. Um, but so the next two will be kind of historical uh, an historical account that the catechism gives us the overview of how prayer developed, what were the first types of prayer, why did people pray, how did they pray, what are some examples. Um, we'll learn right from the beginning that um, a lot of things are found right, right from the story of Genesis. We have liturgical prayer, we have personal prayer and meditation, we have, even have the dark night of the soul. Right? Because if you remember the story of Adam, what happens? God places him in a deep sleep, literally in Hebrew, the sleep of death. And then from him removes Eve. But what the story tells us, and by putting it with Adam at the very beginning of human history, it tells us right from the beginning, those spiritual times of darkness, desolation, dryness, they are just a thing that will affect every single human being at some points in your spiritual journey, right? They are right there in the very creation of the human person. Similarly, we're meant to pray and to join to God with prayer. That's the whole point of breathing into our nostrils, the breath of life, the same breath that created all of creation because the word ruach, the mighty wind, as it says in our translation, which is terrible, should say the spirit of God. That's what created everything. Everything comes from breath. God's breath but then he in a special unique way puts that breath directly in the human person and then we have the story again of the darknesses and the separation of Adam so see he, the Bible is sort of teaching us about prayer from the very beginning pages all the way through to Revelation so that's where we're heading after we finish uh, this first handout in the first um, probably 15 or 20 minutes of next week okay well, thanks for coming. We'll pray, and I'll be on them tomorrow to get this air conditioning fixed. <laughs> it's killing so us. It sounds like it came on. Well, it comes on, or, or it tries to, but it doesn't blow anything. Because when I was in here setting up initially, I had everything closed, and I turned it on. And you can hear, you, yeah. like you can hear something, but nothing's, I don't think if you sit in it under any of these, it's, it, anything's happening. Yeah. So... Just, yeah, a tiny bit. So they just have to fix it. But. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and end in prayer then. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to gather together, Lord. And we ask that as we begin this journey of understanding prayer, that you will give us more and more the desire to pray, and that you will help to purify our prayer in every way possible. Help us through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary and all the different saints that they who themselves live lives of deep and abiding prayer will be our models and examples. But above all, we ask, Lord, that through the person of Jesus, you show us how to pray by the power of his Holy Spirit in us and draw us ever more closer to yourself in the intimacy that you have called each and every one of us to. We ask this in Jesus, our Lord's name. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right, you guys. I will see you next week.